Good morning, guys. Hope everybody's well. Today is the 20th of May. And uh, markets, I don't see a reason for them to go down in the short term, unless there is some dramatic news, either on the inflation side, which also seems to be moderating a little bit. Anyway, one of the companies that showed up on my radar that I think you should look at is a company called Elastic. Now, Elastic makes a software as a service solution and a open source software solution as well. The way the way to think about Elastic is if you are looking to be able to search any information from a large database of any sort, Elastic is probably the best solution to help you index it, which means you are able to put a, a database on top of it to be able to tell you where which records exist, be able to retrieve it, and be able to catalog it. So Elastic typically works with other third-party solutions such as MongoDB for a database or MySQL, Postgres, any of the other databases. Elastic does have a database, but they're not known for their database in an operational format for being able to store and retrieve information for your production applications. What they're known instead is for search, retrieval, and indexing. So let's take a look at Elastic overall. Simple way to think about it, Elastic is a software as a service company and they provide a software solution that works in conjunction with other database solutions to be help you index, retrieve, and get your information more quickly. Now, many people at the very superficial level ask me, I have Google for search, why do I need Elastic? Now, Google doesn't work with your incoming data within your company. So you can't take Google and put it against your log files. You can't take Google and put it against your <coughs> e-commerce a database containing all your products and searches. So that becomes much harder. So people use Elastic as a solution for that capability. There are many use cases for Elastic, but the three most important ones, number one is enterprise search. And within enterprise search, there are lots of use cases as well. Some companies, e-commerce companies, use it for helping their customers be able to search for products. So when you type blue pen, you just don't want to have customers see one blue pen that you might have. Uh, and go away. They might mean blue pen from a pen that writes in blue color versus a pen that is blue in color versus a pen that might have blue with a uh, with a multicolor requirement. So the, all of those things essentially allows you to be able to index and search your solution from an e-commerce perspective very well and be able to help customers retrieve that as the right offering. So that's the first enterprise search. There are other capabilities as well. So a lot of customers also use them for being able to point their enterprise documents against Elasticsearch, be able to retrieve internal content. So for example, your sales team wants to find out, for example, the difference between the latest version of your software that you released and the older version, you can easy, easily find it using Elastic. So people use search and Elastic for that. There are three, usually when people talk about Elastic, there are three components to it. One is the search and indexing parts. One is the analytics and visualization part, which is a product called Kibana. And then the log stash itself, which is an observability platform. So all three of them together allow you to be able to get the full power of Elastic. So that's the first use case, enterprise search. Uh, you see those three, Kibana. Let me just walk you through that. Kibana is more of a visualization engine that you will see quite a bit comes out of the box with a lot of abilities to be able to look at the data. Think of it like a simple BI solution. Elastic search itself, which will help you store search and analyze the data. And then you can connect it to a lot of third-party systems as well. So on top of this, you can build enterprise search. You can build observability. What is observability? We talked about this when we covered one of the other companies, Datadog, in our previous video. Observability is ability to look at what is happening with your applications in real time across a whole host of capabilities. Modern applications are fairly ex comprehensive and fairly complicated. So you'll find they have multiple levels, multiple different solutions, there's an infrastructure layer, the infrastructure layer itself maybe has multiple different capabilities within themselves. There's the application layer, the middleware layer. What observability does is it allows you to monitor every one of these portions and help you understand what is happening. One, from a point of performance, two, from a point of availability, three, from a point of troubleshooting if problems come up. So that's observability. That's the second use case besides enterprise search. And a lot of people are starting using, using Elasticsearch even as, a, even as a security seam solution. So it does compete somewhat if you want to be able to have that with a Splunk or with a Sumo Logic. Essentially what it does is be able to index all of the multiple different search inputs that you get 
from various different solutions, your endpoint search, your perimeter search, your firewalls, and a whole host of other security related um, capabilities that you have within your company that throw out alerts or log files that you want to be able to put into a central location, be able to index them, be able to search for it, find out where problems might be. That's essentially what uh, Elasticsearch does. So three use cases for Elasticsearch. Enterprise search is the first one. Observability is the second one. And security seam is the third one. You can run it either on the public cloud. You can run it on a combination of your own systems and public cloud, or you can run it within your company as a piece of software that you will have. Uh, now, Elastic is available as an open source solution as well, but most people who are large customers, they end up buying the premium license for support and for patches and for upgrades as well and allows you to be able to manage that on an easy basis. So Elastic is a search analytics company. Uh, most of the use cases that you'll find for Elastic, nearly 50% of them or more are actually in the search side. The second is observability and the third is security. Now you can ingest any amount of data into Elastic. Again, it does have a database. It stores files in the JSON at uh, JavaScript object notation format. So when you take the data from multiple different systems, you can ingest that into database that Elastic provides. Uh, it is secure, it is uh, scalable from a storage perspective, and it also gives you the capability to automate that entire workflow. When you ingest the data, when you look at the indexing, when you provide that capability, it allows you to be able to automate that portion. Visualization is done mostly through Kibana. You can have some simple visualization with basic uh, Elastic as well. Kibana, by the way, is a capability, and it's also a product. You can just use Kibana even with an Elastic if you want, and it gives you search and ML AI capability. Uh, out of the box, they offer these two solutions, so to speak. You can use Use it for observability security, but you want to build your own search solution, you can use Elastic for that. Now, as the generative AI capability comes more into picture, one of the things that has come forth is the need for a vector database. Now, essentially what that is, is if you take a lot of documents, images, videos that are provided on the web and other places, and you train your model on top of that, you have to create a vector embedding which means you convert that video image text into a number or a series of numbers actually, to be able to predict what the next number most likely is going to be or the next word might be or what the next sequence might be. That essentially is stored in a vector embedding database. Examples of those in the private side right now are Pinecone and a few others as well. MongoDB also claims to do this. Now search becomes a very important part to generative AI as well. And a lot of people are starting to think about use Elastic for that portion uh, within the company. So you use RAG, which is Retrieval Augmented Generation Applications, you have either a uh, LLM, such as uh, Llama from Meta or OpenAI Solution or Mistral or Claude from Anthropic, any of those. And then you're using that to be able to retrieve data and you can augment it with your own data, which is on top of Elastic that connects to your own system. So you do that portion and you can train the LLM on top of this data. So when you get the answer back, it actually has your data plus the LLM that is already built out of the box. So it helps you scale it at very, very large and finally, it becomes search becomes the foundational requirement for a lot of these AI applications. And in some senses, basically, you're trying to search for information overall. Um, you can run Elastic on your own systems. You can run it on your own hardware. You can run it on cloud hardware, or you can run it on top of Kubernetes, which is a container-based solution. And when you do that, it allows you to be able to get any kind of data from any kind of system, monitor that in real time, manage that in real time, and use it for both application performance monitoring or be able to manage it for metrics management, managed reporting. All of them are possible with Elasticsearch. So you can do all of that with, you use Elastic as your engine for indexing and management. You use visualization Kibana, and that becomes your observability solution overall, either via a real-time monitoring system or via a log file monitoring system. At a very high level, most enterprises will have essentially a control plane. The control plane and the data plane are two different elements. So just let me talk about it. This may be allocated system. So you have a data plane which actually stores all the data that you get from the system into an elastic. The control plane manages that data plane and manages the application, make sure that you can understand very quickly how you can get to that data, move it from place to another. So when a user comes in, they might come in via a proxy and it gets allocated to one of the multiple different instances that you have, which then works via secure systems to be able to go into a control plane that says, where should I place this request for? Which is then going into an allocator system that actually does the ESMS, the Elasticsearch logging and administration. So administrators usually work with the control plane. It's not the users. Users only care about the return from that system. Now, 
when you have multiple different systems giving data and ingesting data into an Elastic, whether it is, so Logstash is, as I mentioned, there are three solutions, Kibana, Logstash, and Elastic. People usually use all three of them in the context of a security solution or in context of an observability solution. So when you have multiple different small point solutions in each of these places collecting data, they would then consolidate all that data, send it to a log stash, which then works with Elastic to store that data, index it, and then is visualized within Kibana. So that's the way to think about it. So when a company goes in and says, I have all this data coming in from all these systems, uh, I want to be able to collect all that data, you collect all those metrics in real time into a log stash, via log stash, not into a log stash, via log stash into that elastic and you view it within Kibana. So it's a fairly comprehensive observability solution. We talked a little bit about search, but observability is where they're seeing a lot more traction. To give you context for this year, 2024, uh, Elastic is going to do a little over $1.2 billion. They're valued at about 11 billion, so they're about nine times price to sales nearly 25 to 25, 26% of their revenue comes from observability, which is the fastest growing portion. And their cloud solution is nearly about 30 to 40, close to about 50% of their. So they're getting a good job, doing a good job of moving customers away. This is one of those other transition companies, uh, if you will, to a certain extent. Elastic has been around since 2010. And they went public in 2018, 2019, something like that. And even since the 2008 timeframe, they've been slowly moving their customers over across to the cloud. They work with AWS, they work with Microsoft Azure, they work with Google Cloud, they work with all of those solutions. So you can essentially install, manage, make sure that you can run it at scale. And uh, 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 Elastic works with all of those cloud solutions to provide you a solution that is possible to manage it within the cloud itself. So you can take any log file, any metric, any trace, anything that might happen, and other data that might come in within different systems, ingest it with a secure solution. You can extract the data, transform it. So very similar to what you saw when we covered uh, Informatica. Extract, transform, load, extract the data from these multiple sources, log files, put them into a system, and then make sure that you can then uh, available visualization and automation. So this is done via uh, Logstash. This is done via Elastic itself. This is done via Kibana. And then all of those are available through the observability solution. People like Comscast are using it to be able to manage their solution. From a security perspective, does compete, as I said, with Splunk and to a certain extent with Sumo Logic and a few host other solutions as well. I believe now even Palo Alto Networks has a Seam solution of their own. They probably built that on top of Elastic and a few other solutions. Almost everybody does use Elastic in some way, shape, or form. So they take the ingestion and the data whether it comes from multiple different uh, security solutions as opposed to previously log files, this will come from multiple security solutions. Same thing, it works with managing, indexing, searching it, manipulating it, putting into a federated database, visualizing using Kibana, and then provide it whether it is a endpoint solution or a cloud solution. So a lot of people use it for that. Or if you want to build, so those are the three, the third of the applications that most people use it for actually is search. You, they have data connectors. Um, so this is, Competing to a certain extent with a solution, we talked a little bit about Informatica, but you can get a lot of connectors. Informatica typically is a much older solution used for more of the structured data to a large extent, but you can connect any data into search. You can connect any data into, you can ingest any data into Elastic. Then you will work to create bindings and indexes on top of that. You can visualize it provided via search. So a lot of customers using it for all of those three requirements. They have their own language, ESQL. Elastic Search Query language, very similar to SQL to a certain extent, a little bit better in some areas. Allows the ability for people, especially developers, to be able to search index, search the indexes, transform it, make sure that it's easy to be able to use, and then unifies the data across multiple different locations for visualization on top of Kibana. Now, they've done a good job of being able to get the AI capability into their solution on an ongoing basis. So whether it is from a building block making sure over the last few years there is support for a lot of different learning systems or the AI capabilities that they provided for being able to do much better observability or much better security management. So they've invested a lot in AI specifically for both supervised and unsupervised learning. So they have a lot of support capabilities that they've built over the last few years. They had a CEO transition in 2022. The new CEO is a guy called Ashish Kulkarni, who previously was with Sun Microsystems. He's with eBay. He's done a lot of different. He was, came in as the CPO, product officer three years ago, and then the founder of Elastic, who actually built it maybe about 10 years ago, uh, he was the CTO, Chief Technology Officer, became the CEO, and now he's even left the board. He's just uh, 
one of the investors in the company, if you will, uh, and has done a fairly good job of bringing Elastic to the point where it is. He built the first version of it in 2009, released it in 2010, got a lot of companies to adopt it as an open source solution, then went to the cloud. So he's done a lot of good transitions overall. Okay, foundation tools. If you look at why people use Elastic, why do they prefer Elastic over everything else, especially in the AI side? Uh, they give a lot of vector search capabilities. So remember I talked about vector bindings. What are bindings? So let's assume you have a ton of text available. Computers find it easier and also the software finds it easier to be able to put a specific number associated with them as opposed to sorting the text so we can predict what the next text would be. It actually takes each one of those texts and puts it into a specific number and binds that and keeps that storage available in its system. Now that creates a complete network of being able to see which, or a neural network, if you would, that allows you to be able to predict which are the likelihood of the next letter based on the previous letter that you had. So transformer, transformer models and NLP models themselves, it allows you to be able to scale up very, very quickly and be able to use pre-built solutions overall to be able to work with Elasticsearch. Um, they claim, again, Elastic claims that they actually help a lot more companies with the AI model. I suspect you're going to have some uplift to Elastic because of AI. It's not a direct beneficiary 100%, but it does benefit a lot from the AI trend moving forward. So what do you need search generator if you want to be able to do generate with AI, if you want it within the company? So right now, a lot of the employees are probably going, hey, I already get very good answers from ChatGPT or I get it from Gemini. Why can't I do it with my company's own data? So a lot of companies are looking at trying to find a way to be able to take the search capabilities, move it into the system, use the right embedding model, for example, an LLM of any kind, and then be able to provide all those. Now, Vector databases are a competition to both MDB and also to Elastic, MongoDB and Elastic. So the capabilities wise, just storing and searching, this is what essentially Pinecone does, creating the vector embeddings, Pinecone does this as well. Most of the smaller early stage does only this, but being able to provide the end-to-end -end solution, this is the historical advantages that Elastic has had allows them to be able to get a much better model. Now, now does, uh, will a, uh, uh, OpenAI or a Google search use them. I doubt they actually will go ahead and use them. They built their own systems for most parts, but Elastic is the solution for everybody else. So with AI, you can create a lot of different applications. You can use it for help desk, you can use it for customer success in being able to be able to find and ask questions about your customers, e-commerce material search as well. Uh, and also make sure that they have compliance requirements or finance and predictive maintenance requirements. All of those are possible with Elastic solution. So at a summary level, they have three primary applications, search, which is their core bread and butter, observability, which is monitoring applications at scale, and then security for being able to find out the needle from the haystack, if you will. They've done a good job of all of these. Uh, a lot of companies, including Gartner and Forrester, are starting to realize that they've actually been a leader in this space. Instead of showing every Gartner and every Forrester magic quadrant, they are a leader in the inside engine, they are a strong performer in cognitive search. In security, they've actually done a good job of being able to be on the top of the cognitive search. And AI operations as well, Forrester Wave. So they tend to win primarily because they have a strong platform. Uh, they have a lot of people actually using it, tens of thousands of customers, if not more than that, developers actually using Elastic, being able to download it, an open source solution, work on top of it and make it work. Uh, they have a lot of partnerships with all the industry leading uh, cloud providers and also third party providers. And also they tend to be fairly extensible and from a commercial perspective. So how can they grow? The question I always ask is, can they double from here? They're about $11 billion in revenue right now. And they're growing at about, they grew last year at about 19, 20%. This year, they're expected to grow 2024 at about 16, 17%. Can they double from here? The answer is relatively yes. The elastic search market, the total TAM itself is about $30 billion just for search, enterprise search, versus price search, observability, and security. So they've done a good job of expanding their TAM from about $10 billion to about $30 billion. So that capability is good. So they can get to about at least one third of $10 billion, about $10 billion. So they can get officially from the 1 billion in revenue, 1.2 billion in revenue this year, they can get to about uh, two to 5 billion in revenue. Take them a little bit of time, they're growing slower than the other people. Uh, that's the first question. So they can they get there? They can get there. How will they have to execute to get there? They have to really find a way to be able to tell more customers that they can use them for observability and security, which are open spaces, along with the fact that they compete with a lot of players. But within search, they have to be able to expand and tell the story that they can be used for generative AI more than anything else. 
roughly about 40 to 50,000 people, customers use uh, Elastic. They've got about tens of thousands of customers who are paying more than $10,000 a month, but I wouldn't say tens of thousands, thousands of customers, and about a uh, little less than a thousand or a few thousand customers paying more than $100,000 a month on an annualized basis, right? So they have a lot more customers that they can get to who can adopt Elastic. Uh, the data volume itself grows because they charge on the cloud by data volume, and they adopt them for use cases, not just for search. They use them for observability. They also use them for security, and they, are, uh, move, they have different tiers of pricing. They have the platform tier, which is the highest, and so on and so forth. So they can move customers from base level solution to a higher level solution, giving them more capabilities more than anything else. Moving across to the cloud is more profitable for them, and moving across to more solutions is also more profitable to them. So the three monetization models, if you want to buy it on the cloud, you get a standard and then gold plate platinum and, and also the enterprise solution. As you go across this, it gets more expensive as you would expect. And then if you're using it on your own, which is in a hybrid model or you know, on premises, you can get actually free solution of Elastic. You can download it. You can uh, go ahead and start using it right away on your own so on your own servers. A lot of people do this. Uh, a lot of smaller companies do this, but the bigger companies will typically go here. And most companies are going across to the cloud itself. Okay, so they have a lot of small customers who actually try it, buy it, completely self-serve, download it, and start using it. And the commercial and enterprise customers, they have a combination of partners that they sell to and also direct customer sales that they do. They have a few resellers as well. Uh, so at a glance, 19% year-over-year growth in 2023, uh, which is the first quarter of 2024 for us. Uh, Cloud is growing faster at about 30%, 44% of revenue nearly. Cloud is nearly 44% of revenue. They're operating at about a 13% non-gap margin. So overall gross margin is about 77, 77 to 80% gross margin, which is very high. And they have nearly 1,200 customers over $100,000. So 1,200 customers over $100,000 and about four or 5,000 customers growing at about $10,000 per year. So total revenue last quarter, 328 billion. Cloud revenue is million, sorry, not billion. Cloud revenue is about 45% of that. About 1,200 customers growing very, very well. That's the good part. They're growing this top customer base very, very well to about a little over 1,200 customers uh, that have grown to about 1,200. Nearly 5,000 customers, 4,200 customers who are spending more than $10,000 per month, per year, excuse me. Full year guidance uh, from a total perspective, revenue they're expecting to be in the $1.2 billion range, growing at about 18% year over year. Uh, constant currency by 17% wouldn't be too worried. They have actually have a non gap operating margin of roughly about 12%, uh, 11%. So that's very, very good. And the market itself is expected to about 45 billion to about 88 billion. Now, this includes all of those markets I mentioned, security, observability, and search. Within search itself is about 31 billion, as I told you. This is realistically the market that they should be expecting and security observability should get them to a much longer place. That's elastic. Now, one of the things that I learned and I heard from a lot of people was don't just uh, keep the paid portion of your solution for um, the, uh, paid subscribers, can you also do a quick analysis of the uh, fundamentals and technical? So I'm going to go through a simpler version of it than I did before. And let's try and go through that really quickly. Okay, so we start first go to the fundamentals. We start with the fundamentals. It always start with the income statement on an annualized basis. Okay, revenue has grown from roughly about the $88 million in 2016 to a billion dollars. Look at that, that's ridiculously good growth. That's nearly 12 times growth, very fast growth, 80%, 60%, 70%. So it's been growing consistently down 80 to almost 70 to almost 60 to 40%, to 40%, 20. Now it's slowed down dramatically. Okay, so margins are still good, about 77, 78%. And they actually were losing money all along. Their net income has been losing money. So that's not a good sign, but let's see if they're turning it around. So total revenue is about 19% year over year growth. So this is a good sign after growing at nearly about 15, 16%, 17, 18%, sorry. Now they're getting back to the 19, 20% uh, on this quarter. But okay, so now they've actually turned a profit. 176 million, they've turned a profit. So that's a good sign. I like that quite a bit. Growth slowing, not a good sign. But the fact that it's growing very well is good. 1.2 billion in cash, about 500 million manageable debt. Cash flow is positive. 
they're expensive from a PE perspective. So this is only because we've recently turned a profit. So it is gonna be a little bit expensive. This seems high for a price to sales ratio of growing at about 16% year over year, 17, 18%, that's high. 75% gross margins, 53% net margins, very good, very, very good net margins as well. As long as they can get to that point of profitability very quickly, I think that's a good sign. Okay, from a monthly chart perspective, this looks like a cup. That looks like a cup and it looks like it created a handle and now it seems to be reversing. That's what it is, it's reversing. So this seems to be the reversal point somewhere over here at the 92 mark is the reversal point. It seems to have reversed. Uh, earnings are expected in a couple of uh, days, in about three days. They're gonna get earnings in three days, is it? Let's just quickly look at that. Yeah, earnings is in a week, in a week. Okay, so this is the cup and I could literally automate or maybe make it a little bit more better. I'm gonna do it like this and pull this up a little bit. Let's move this and make this a little bit more tighter and then move this down so you can get a little bit of a better view. That's a cup. That's the handle, so reversal point at the 92 mark. This looked like it wants to head higher. It seems to want to go a little bit higher. So we know it's a cup and a handle. That means it wants to go up. It wants to go much higher, although the valuations are rich. But then again, valuations are rich for everybody right now, man. That's what is worrisome. So 93, they seem to be consolidating more than anything else. Earnings are coming up in 30th of May. So that's about a week or so, a little more than a week, 10 days from now. So this is, seems to be a little bit of the trying to hit the top. Uh, it is going to pull back a little bit. Uh, the RSI seems to be slightly okay. MACD is slightly okay. So it wants to consolidate. It doesn't want to go down. It wants to consolidate. Within that cup and handle, where I showed you in the long term, this seems to be another point of a cup and a handle. At least it's a cup right now, no handle yet. That's a very nice cup. So it looks like it might head a little bit lower, which it already has, but this looks like it wants to go higher. It wants to break through the 112 mark and get to at least the previous gap that it was after previous earnings. So it wants to get to the 119 time frame. I'd wait for a quick move during the, uh, so in the next 10 days, it should probably move a little bit lower would be my sense uh, toward the 107, 100 and, 100 and even 106 mark. It would lovely if you get to 102, but I doubt it gets there. And after earnings, if the earnings are really good, it gets to 119 and immediately after earnings, it tries to make its run back again to the top of this level, which is in the 130 mark. But otherwise, if earnings are not so good, which I don't expect it to be, they're expecting about 16, 17% growth, uh, which is not a very high mark. If the guidance is poor, which is what a lot of software companies have been doing. So keep that in mind. If guidance is poor, this goes 20% lower easily to get to the 90%, $90 mark. Guidance has been lower for a lot of companies. And as soon as the guidance has been lower, which means they already expected to grow at about 18%. If they come back and say, we're going to grow at 15%, this is going to 90. But otherwise it wants to, it seems to want to go a little bit higher to the 120, 118 mark at least. So we're going to wait for that. Thank you very much for watching. Let me know what you think.